now the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. I'm happy to uh, contribute to your lecture series. Um, yeah, so I will talk today about what I've been working on the past, yeah, mostly during my time at Imperial. Um, it's, uh, it's so I'll talk on positivity bounds and in particular on the positivity bounds in the presence of gravity and what IR lessons can it can we learn uh, which are relevant for the UV physics. Um, I will start with a sorry. I'll start with a short introduction so that if you, because I was told this is relatively broad, in case you have seen those slides or uh, any, or you feel like you know that you can have a coffee or anything. So, um, so general relativity as an effective field theory, I sort of hope that this is how everyone sees uh, general relativity these days, um, because we do know that, like, even if we start with a core here, which is like our knowledge uh, on Einstein general relativity, we do know that at the, here's some very approximate length scale, energy scale, then at the energies uh, of order and Planck, the, we expect something uh, some UV completion for general relativity because uh, GR becomes non-normalizable and we do need another theory at those uh, energy scales. Um, the only really like uh, uh, UV completion that we have in mind normally is the string theory. And we, we do have also in mind another scale somewhere, somewhere below Planck scale, at which we would start to feel the effect of those um, uh, effect of any any new physics that would UV complete uh, GR. That could be some new massive state, or it can be just in, in 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 terms of some higher derivative operators that would correct the Einstein-Hilbert term. And on on the other end, on the other energy scale and like low energies, we could also expect some modifications for GR. Uh, these are mostly motivated by the accelerated expansion of our universe these days. And they, that could be like graviton mass or some scalar tensor theories. Um, these theories typically decrease the uh, strong coupling scale of GR down to uh, the scale lambda the so-called lambda three, which is smaller than M Planck. And then in that sense, uh, there are aspects in which those modifications perform worse than Einstein's theory. The problem with that is with, with these modifications is that there's experimentally, we don't have much experimental data to verify that. Uh, mostly because like, if, if we have like all the experiments for Einstein's GR, like from hundred years ago, like, like this one, which was like for the light detection uh, by sun, um, then experiments that would test either nonlinearities or high energies, uh, such as uh, large scale structure formation or gravitational waves or uh, black holes, uh, like those experiments, they, they come in these days and, and there's not enough precision there for us being able to test like those wild uh, theoretical models that sometimes we have in mind. And um, that's why my the goal of this talk is actually uh, to impose theoretical consistency conditions on any theories, effective field theories of gravity, trying to constrain the modifications that are allowed just by purely, purely theoretical means. And they don't care, like positivity bounds, they don't care whether we are constraining the IR modifications or UV completion, UV modica modifications to gravity. And that's sort of like the nice bit about those. Um, so let me, uh, I have to, I have to just like skip through the, no, not skip, like I have to go through the positivity bounds a little bit and I'll do them in the most simple form. Um, so as to be like, Clear as, as clear as possible. So positivity bounds are uh, some bounds on the effective field theory coefficients uh, by assuming the existence of a hypothetic uh, 
uh, UV completion of this theory that is Lorentz invariant, that is unitary, that is local, and is crossing symmetric. And these assumptions, uh, even if they sound simple, they lead to constraints on the combinations of Wilson coefficients in the low energy effective action, which are the positivity bound. And they've been like a popular topic uh, for the last, uh, yeah, I don't know, like maybe they got a bit more revived like uh, around this time, like let's say 10 years ago. Um, so typically, um, like positivity bounds are imposed as bounds on the two to two scattering amplitude. And in terms of the uh, Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U, the two to two scattering amplitudes have the following analytic structure. But here I am uh, assuming that T equals zero. So there are, there are like some features uh, present here. There are physical poles at uh, S uh, equals M squared and S equals uh, four M squared. Uh, here I have shifted that, uh, sorry. And uh, there are, so, sorry, yes, uh, physical poles at M squared and three M squared, and there are branch cuts from zero to four M squared, where M is like the, yeah, the, the particle that's scattering uh, in the theory. And it's analytic everywhere else. And this analytic structure allows to, to pick out a con contour and write the simple dispersion relation for the amplitude in terms of the Mandelstam variables. And one can then deform this integral uh, and write this uh, dispersion relation in, 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 in this form, which uh, basically uh, just says that there are some contributions from the poles here. Uh, there are the contributions from the cuts over the discontinuity, and there are some uh, corrections, uh, no, some some constants that uh, uh, that that uh, characterize uh, the values of the arcs at infinity, and and then from this you can get the positivity in a simple way. Uh, you relate the discontinuity here to the imaginary part of the amplitude, and then you relate the imaginary part via the optical theorem to the total cross scattering cross-section, which is positive. And uh, one can also subtract these poles further because these are known contributions. And you can define like pole subtracted amplitudes, uh, which like where you just subtract those terms and impose the positivity bounds. Uh, usually in the simplest form, they come for the second order derivative of the scattering amplitude with respect to the variable s. Um, so these are the positivity bounds. And as you see, the, I mean, those up, these uh, uh, assumptions about the unitarity and uh, like say analyticity, unitarity and crossing symmetry, they come in in a very clear way and lead to very powerful statements that we will uh, employ. Um, relevant to gravity, um, there's typically one assumption, uh, I mean, among others, that is made when we derive positivity bounds. And this is like the Froissart bound that is valid. And Froissart bound is the statement that the integral at the large values of energy when S goes to infinity um, decays uh, faster than, sorry, that, uh, that it doesn't, that it, that, that it grows slower than S squared, I'm sorry. So that's a, that's a statement for a fixed T. And in this um, amplitude, we see that because without this assumption, we would be unable to treat these arcs in, in the dispersion relation. And now the assumption that we have those, that it decays, uh, that it doesn't grow faster than S squared, allows us to write those, uh, express those arc integrals in terms of these two subtractions. And um, this then allows the application of the positivity bounds because then uh, basically we just, when taking the second derivative and subtracting the poles, all these terms uh, disappear. And, and then we just are left with the, with the second derivative of the amplitude and the imaginary part. Um, strictly speaking, the Froissart bound is not applicable for massless theories. Uh, however, we typically expect uh, it like from uh, string theory, uh, spe specifically from the Regit behavior as we will 
discuss later. Um, an important uh, addition to the standard positivity bound, uh, one of the additions, because yeah, there have been many developments recently, is that you have, it's like what we call improved positivity bound. And to understand what improved positivity bounds are about is just, we can easily do that by looking what the optical ther theorem is saying it and where the positivity actually comes from. So optical theorem says that the imaginary part of the amplitude, the one that comes from loops, uh, basically, uh, is expressed as a sum of those squared amplitudes to all the uh, mid intermediate uh, configurations, like uh, where the initial state could uh, um, scatter to. Uh, and each of these terms, uh, since that is an absolute value squared, it's positive on its own. And uh, so each contribution in this uh, optical theorem is positive on its own. So to improve the positivity bounds would mean that we, um, we split this, uh, this imaginary part in the contributions that are known. These could be like some massive loops that we, massive light, but light loops that we do know and move them on the left-hand side of our positivity bound so that now we have the second order derivative of the improved amplitude, uh, sorry, uh, the second order derivative of the amplitude. And then we subtract, we just move on the left-hand side, those known but uh, known imaginary, contri known contributions to the imaginary part, and then ask that the remainder is positive as well. Um, we will use that a little bit later, um, but just, uh, yeah, it's, it's important to understand that it's not like something, uh, that there's no spe speculation here, that it's like, if you believe in positivity bounds as such, then all the improved positivity bounds must be satisfied as well. Um, yeah, so having gone through the positivity bound, let me talk about the difficulties that gravity presents. Um, so, like I will talk about the T pole a lot. So, uh, but what it is, it's very simple. Like in any effective field theory with matter fields minimally coupled to gravity, um, the scattering amplitude always has this T pole contribution, which really just comes from this process, which is like the T channel uh, exchange of uh, say, this is like minimally coupled scalar, but in being so schematic, it can be any other field as well, uh, as you see. Because of this exchange of the massless graviton here, uh, when you work out the kinematics, the amplitude always comes with a T-pole. And, uh, and usually what you would want instead, there's this other contribution of S squared uh, that you that like has some dimensional constant, which depends on the EFT couplings. And you would want to constrain the, that coefficient C. But the problem is that typically uh, the Positivity bounds are taken in the forward limit, forward limit meaning that t goes to zero. And like in strict forward limits, that that amplitude becomes singular, but even slightly away from the forward limit, it still would be the dominant contribution uh, for the positivity bounds and would be, we, we, we like essentially we become unable to constrain those, uh, uh, yeah, those dimensional couplings that we would like to constrain. Um, so the, I will part, like, like part of the talk, I will talk about what to do with the pole. Uh, and um, as it was suggested initially, um, probably this is what people often do when they don't know what to do, is that one could just like discard the T channel pole. And there were some uh, nice arguments. Like, for example, there was an argument saying that, yeah, one could look at the comp compactified positivity bounds uh, by compactifying gravity from 4D to 3D and in 3D graviton is not propagating. That's why the T channel pole should not be a problem. And yeah, it, it was a nice work, uh, but somehow still, even taking that argument into account, uh, one can check that scattering, uh, for example, I'm saying for example, because we looked at many theories, but say QED, where there's just electron and, and uh, Maxwell field and graviton. And we, if we look at this four photon scattering in QED where electron is minimally coupled to gravity, 
This theory is naively randomizable up to n Planck. And uh, we could ask what happens if we then just try to impose those positivity bounds by dropping the T channel pole, just ask demanding the positivity of the rest. And uh, by treating that carefully, uh, one could see that there's inconsistency with positivity bounds unless we introduce uh, new physics above a very low scale for QED. Uh, in the case of QED, this scale lambda uh, that we found uh, above which new physics need to be uh, yeah, in, uh, introduced uh, is very low. I mean, it's like 10 to the 8 GeV, um, which is not when we would uh, typically expect new physics in QED. And so the resolution of this, it's not really a resolution, it's just saying that uh, simply put, strict positivity in the presence of gravity can only apply uh, when a clean decoupling limit exists. And by clean decoupling limit, I mean that you can send M Planck to infinity and then there will still be some contributions to the scattering amplitude left that you can uh, that you can bound with bind with positivity bounds uh, still in that limit. That would just basically mean if you look at processes that are just electron scatterings without any exchange of uh, uh, gravitons, uh, which is, however, uh, unrealistic because uh, gravity is always coupled to electrons. But but say uh, if you would forget about gravity. Uh, or if you would be looking at some processes where there is no T channel pole, uh, then you could use this strict positivity in the presence of gravity. However, if the low energy scattering amplitude is of the form uh, that I show here, meaning that it has the T channel pole and it has some contribution um, to the S squared, which, however, is such that in the limit when M plan goes to infinity also vanishes, then it means that by taking, there's no clean decoupling limit because all the effect disappears when you send M Planck to infinity. So in these cases, you cannot demand a strict positivity. Um, so in this case, for example, we, I mean, so in this case, when 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 the when we have an effective field theory where the low energy scattering amplitude takes this form, uh, where M to the power of four is some, where M is some scale that is like below or around the cutoff of the theory, we conjecture that instead a weakened positivity should apply, that, that this constant C should be, should, should allow for a small negativity, small because uh, this ratio should be uh, less than one, like uh, because typically any theory we have a, uh, has a cutoff that is lower than M Planck uh, times some order one number, like and in the QED case, uh, this uh, particular bound uh, was that the M is of order M over electron charge, electron mass over electron charge. Um, so one has to learn, somehow learn to live with the fact that when there is gravity in the picture and you cannot, uh, when, you, when, you, when you don't have a way how to deal with the T-channel pole, that you cannot impose strict positivity bounds, there has to be some negativity that is allowed. Uh, also, um, yeah, also from the positivity bounds viewpoint. Um, a confirmation, some, somehow a confirmation of that uh, for, for, yeah, came from, from another work that I actually like very much. These people, Karun Ut, Mazach, Rosselli, Simons, Duffin, they proposed a way how to deal with the teacher and elbow. Um, the, the model that they looked at was, uh, Simple, it was like a, a massive scalar field. Uh, sorry, no, some massless scalars with gravity. And then uh, uh, they were just like, so these, uh, they parameterized the scattering amplitudes in terms of the crossing symmetric quantities uh, and these uh, low energy effective uh, parameters. They just like uh, G2, G3, G4, they, they they, they, are, they are enumerate different effects at different orders of uh, Mandel's variables. And uh, they looked what, what are the constraints on those coming from the positivity bounds. And what they did, they said, let's not go to forward limit. Uh, instead, they noticed that 
uh, the impact parameter of scattering is actually the Fourier conjugate of the momenta. And instead of saying at what momenta you will be looking at, they said, let's, let's look at some finite values of the impact parameter. And let's look at the positivity bounds and dispersion relations in the impact parameter space. Uh, for example, like if you would be looking at what is the, if you would be looking in their language at T channel pole, uh, but if you would like take a Fourier transform of the T pole, um, then the T channel pole here would correspond by taking this, uh, uh, this, this, this Fourier function um, in terms of the impact parameter to be a delta function. And they said, let's just have, let's have some different kind of uh, those Fourier uh, wave functions. And let's have uh, them such that the positivity bound still holds. So there are some positivity requirements these functions have to satisfy, but then they can do like optimization, numerical optimization problem by, by probing the amplitude uh, in this uh, impact parameter space, by just picking different kinds of these uh, Test, uh, test wave functions and uh, localize the amplitude near one over M, where one over M, uh, where, where M is the cutoff scale of the theory. Um, it's, um, yeah, if I would have uh, enough enthusiasm, I would be happy to sometimes look how it actually works, but like the, the plots that they have, the results are quite nice uh, for for the for for dimension for space time dimensions larger than uh, four, uh, they have these exclusion plots for G two and G three, where G two here is just the the first term in the amplitude, and G three is like the uh, the higher derivative corrections already, and they like the, these are like the allowed uh, parameter space. And well, what I wanted to show here is that you actually do see that in this G2 parameter, which is uh, in front of the S squared contribution we talked about uh, before, they also see that negativity is allowed. Even if you go, if you, even if you honestly go away from the forward limit and deal with the T channel pole, uh, there is some negativity uh, uh, in the EFT parameters in the presence of gravity. Um, so yeah, in, in what I want to talk about for the rest of this talk is about another way how to deal with the T channel pole. And uh, this amounts to making more explicit assumptions what the scattering amplitude in the UV looks like. And uh, a way how to think about it is it's like if we look at this term, which, uh, which enters the dispersion relation, this discontinuity integral, then if you remember in the dispersion relation, uh, there was the amplitude on left-hand side, and then there was the discontinuity integral on the right-hand side. And you do know that on the, uh, in the amplitude, there's T channel pole. And if the equality holds, there must be a T channel pole appearing in, the, this, in, in this integral of the dispersion relation as well. So the question is, can we, can we like single out this T channel pole and make them cancel? And uh, what, the answer is that one can do that if one assumes uh, something more specific about the, the high energy behavior of this amplitude. And then assuming some simple things uh, like that the Froissart type bound still exists, uh, meaning that it doesn't, the, the amplitude doesn't grow faster as S square. Then the fact that the, that a dispersion relation with three subtractions is well behaved, um, meaning that um, like the S cube terms uh, don't have singularities. And that some mild analyticity requirements for the T dependence naturally, naturally leads to rigid type behavior. Um, I think we, we like to say that this is uh, independent on regi, uh, on, on regi type behavior. You, can, uh, you could have come across that just by these uh, assumptions. Um, if, 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 however, you are very happy with just assuming regi type behavior from the beginning, then 
uh, maybe one could say that these are relatively mild assumptions. And so what we do is then we parameterize this discontinuity uh, by these parameters where R of T is a uh, regge residue uh, with the like residue of the associated pole of the scattering. Um, lambda is some energy scale typically if it comes from really string theory considerations, that would be the string scale. And alpha t is the rigid trajectory. And there's a requirement that this alpha t has to be less than two for um, t less than zero. So how does this help? Um, I actually really like how this works out. That's why I will show these details, even though it's really nothing complicated. So. Um, there's this discontinuity integral, and we would like to see where, where is the T-channel pole in the discontinuity integral. So we can split this integral uh, up to some energy scale, the energy scale at which we assume, uh, beyond which we assume that the rigid behavior is the dominant one. Um, we can like massage a bit integral so that there's just like a, a cube here. And then we can actually just evaluate those. We can we can leave this uh, amplitude below the cutoff the way it is, and we can evaluate this integral at high energies, given the, the, our assumption on the discontinuity. And then here, this result of the integration, assuming that alpha t is analytic at t equals zero and can be expanded as two plus alpha prime t plus uh, like further um, terms in the Taylor expansion, the T pole becomes explicit, uh, meaning that if you just do this expansion here, which I have not done, but um, because I, yeah, it, it, it just quite explicit. It comes with the, with this factor, one over T poles uh, comes comes with this factor. Then then this T pole that comes from this term can be matched to the T pole on coming from the from the scattering amplitude, and uh, they can just be cancelled. Uh, with each other for these values of R uh, over alpha prime, meaning that it just has to be a quantity of order one. Uh, yeah, I'm here I'm writing this schematical because you have to take into account also that there's U channel and uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, but basically the message is that the T channel pole like honestly cancels out if you assume the uh, rigid type behavior in the UV for the discontinuity of the scattering amplitude. Uh, and then you are left with, um, with this uh, uh, well-behaved uh, positivity bound, uh, namely that the second, uh, that in the forward limit, the second uh, order derivative of the amplitude has to be larger than this uh, quantity, uh, which depends, the, the the, the subscript S just means that this is the um, S channel uh, parameterization for the amplitude, whereas you have the same um, quantities also for the U channel. And uh, in uh, here we have, and there's, yeah, okay. So now I'm coming to another subtlety that I have defined this quantity that we call A hat. And it is a limit when M plan goes to infinity of this uh, real, of the actual, sorry, of the actual amplitude multiplied by M Planck squared. And then we have subtracted the poles as before. But, so this is a very important point in fact, because uh, I did not talk about that yet, but um, in when, when, when we have massless particles, the problem is not only that the Froissart bound um, is not formally valid, uh, there is a bigger problem, which is that this, uh, in that analytic structure that I showed you before, where there were branch cuts from uh, starting from minus infinity to zero, and then from four m squared till plus infinity on the real s axis. Um, in this case, uh, if mass of the particles that being are being exchanged zero, though, though that branch cut just stretches all over the real axis, and in that case, you cannot. Um, there's no way how to analytically continue the scattering amplitude to the upper half plane. And uh, there's no way how to close the contour. And you cannot really like 
uh, go through all the derivation of the positivity bounds as, as, as a standard. So, however, that those branch cuts only arise if you have loop contributions from the massless particles. And since our massless particle here, where we will be considering later is the graviton, then, um, then all these loop contributions will be suppressed with additional powers of M flank. Um, because uh, yeah, every time you have a graviton in the loop, you have additional powers from the propagator. So you can suppress all those and, and by, by just taking this limit of this quantity. And then this quantity as such should have uh, analyst, analyticity properties that are suitable for running through the uh, derivation of the positivity part. Um, it's certainly uh, an assumption and I am aware that some people might not be uh, like, like completely com comfortable with that, but it's sort of, uh, I would say it's fair to say that many people would still be interested in looking what positivity bounds give, even if we like close the eyes on this um, issue with, with the massless graviton loops. Uh, in the same time, we do include all the mass, all the loops from massive particles, because we only by this procedure we only say that we'll drop the graviton loops that give those um, branch cuts that stretch through all the uh, real axis. I mean, it's a bit of formal point, but uh, some people, uh, including ourselves, um, are sometimes concerned about this. Having said that, we can return to the discussion. And so having found these positivity bounds for this amplitude, uh, we can also go one step further and remember that there is, uh, the, 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 you can also impose positivity bounds on some derivatives of the scattering amplitude because of the partial wave expansion and uh, the unitarity properties, uh, which would also say that the regular residue is always positive. The like R prime, uh, sorry, not, not the regular residue, but the slope of the regular resi residue is uh, positive as well. It will not have that much effect, but just that we have fixed that as well. Um, so to see where we will go with this, I have to, I'll start back with the QED positivity about just to, to recap what the story is and, and where, what is what we would like to achieve with, with those uh, bounds when applied to QED with gravity. So QED minimally coupled to gravity is itself a low energy effective field theory that if you forget about what is the actual particle content in the, in, in the universe, that it's just like, it's partially UV complete at and above the electron mass. And in there, and, and there's in some sense, in the absence of new, no, new physics, it could be UV complete up until the Planck scale naively. Um, so there's like two versions people work with. There's the fermionic QED where electron is an actual fermion and scalar QED, which is like a toy model where, uh, where the electron is a complex scalar. And in, so it is known that this is sort of like the UV theory in some sense, because you could integrate out the electron and then you arrive at the IR theory, which is like the low energy EFT, uh, the, uh, that, that the constraints, no, sorry, the coefficients of which we could constrain with the positivity bounds. And that is the Euler-Heisenberg theory, which just looks like Einstein-Maxwell theory um, here with some higher derivative corrections. And if we know that, if, if we say that those came just from the electron being integrated out, then we do know those coefficients, the values of those coefficients in front of them, which are the Wilson coefficients here, A1 prime, A2 prime, B3, uh, we do know them exactly. They have been calculated in, I don't know, I already forgot, 70s, 60s, 70s, long time ago. And that the values of those coefficients are known. Um, but what is interesting is to see how the positivity bounds, do, how, how do they work out in this case? So what we want to look at, we want to look at the UV theory 
at the QED itself and look at the four photon scattering in this theory. And uh, four photon scattering in this theory, uh, yeah, in this particular case, I'm looking at the scalar uh, QED. So it has several contributions. Like first, there's the typical contributions due to the minimal coupling of graviton, like these uh, uh, more, uh, uh, very wiggly lines that are, is the are the photons and and just a normal wiggle line is um, is the graviton. So th th this process is just the three level contributions from the minimal coupling uh, between photon and graviton. Then there are those terms that involve graviton exchange. These are the ones that that have have more yeah have have contributions that we would like to constrain. Uh, let's put it this way. And those are more curious because they involve, they really uh, have real graviton exchanges. And we do learn something about the nature of gravity when we explore these contributions. Whereas these ones um, are the easiest ones. You see, they are these, these are contributions that would, would be there even in the absence of gravity because these involve just the electron. These uh, solid lines everywhere is the electron. So those are electron loops that we could integrate out uh, if we would want to go to the IR theory. But let's, let's try and apply uh, positivity bounds on this theory. Um, so the catch here is that, that exactly these processes that are purely uh, that exist in the absence of gravity. These, this is something that is like the known positive UV contribution that can, that is like just calculable, calculable in our in our QED, and they have some specific cut, some some unspecified cutoff, um, and these are such contributions that can be moved in the positivity bounds uh, on the left hand side as we as we talked talked about this before because of the optical theorem since these contributions are positive themselves uh, and we can calculate them within the QED uh, we can just we can just take them out from our um, from our dispersion relation how this works in practice is like if you look at this uh, dispersion relation the way it was defined so there was this small subtracted amplitude with the two subtractions and two integrals over the discontinuity that goes from zero to infinity. And instead we could subtract the known contributions coming from these loops up to some energy scale, which is like some, some cutoff. Uh, since we do know that QED is just an effective field theory, it is natural to just assume that there is a cutoff. We don't know what the cutoff is, but that there is some cutoff on the theory. And then we can define this improved scattering amplitude with the contributions from those massive loops subtracted and see what the positivity bounds uh, would give us if we will subtract the, if we will drop the T channel pole. And what we find. Uh, from this improved forward limit bound on an amplitude with a T channel pole subtracted, because we still wanted to, um, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't explain this right. What, why we are now again dropping the pole is because um, I want to see how, how these different stories, how we see the T channel pole in, in positivity bound, how they come together, starting from when we didn't know what to do with the pole, meaning when we were just discarding the pole, and now when we will later apply um, this rigid type behavior um, explicitly uh, on the positivity bounds. What are the differences, what we learn uh, from positivity bounds when applied on QED and standard model. So if we were dropping the pole, as before, as I mentioned also earlier, uh, from these improved positivity bounds obtained by taking into account the known contributions from the electron loops uh, without any exchange of gravity, um, we got that demanding the positivity of these, uh, this second order derivative of the amplitude leads to a bound on the cutoff scale, actually, because the cutoff scale, because it was in this up, in this integral, as a boundary of the integrals, it does enter the results. And so you have a bound on it. And as I said before, this is like 10 to the eight 
GEV. It's a very low scale. And that's what, that was something that we advocated before, that um, it makes no sense to drop the T-channel pole. Um, it was later found that um, once, once we are starting to include, say, uh, electron loops, uh, it would be fair to admit that we do know also other, that there are other standard model particles. In particular, there's W boson. And uh, these people here, Aoki, Lok, Nomi, Takuda, they found that if you repeat the same uh, trick with improved positivity bounds uh, on this uh, four photon scattering amplitude, that this contribution that comes from the W boson actually raises the cutoff you would derive uh, and it would raise it to 10 to the 13 GeV. And they argue that if you would include even some QCD particles, um, then it would go even up to 10 to the 15 GeV, which then would say that, well, maybe the dropping the, the pole works. Maybe, maybe it works after all, at least in the standard model, because you sort of apply the positivity bounds, you see nothing going wrong. And uh, this was the motivation partially for our, uh, for, for the latest work that I, uh, that I will now uh, switch to, uh, which involves this um, uh, use of the rigid behavior. Um, and to see what we learn from that, um, we will look at like photon graviton scattering. Um, and we will look at the, Graviton, yeah, photon graviton scattering up to order S squared in the standard model. And it turns out that, that in the standard model, all the uh, contributions to this process is actually uh, just captured, um, captured by this one operator. Since it's such a, yeah, since it's such a specific process, uh, there are other operators that, that would, uh, that, that, that would maybe, uh, come in, well, that do come in in like this Euler-Heisenberg action, but up to the level S squared, and for this particular process, only this one operator is relevant. And since we are looking at the dominant effect in standard model, then this dominant uh, contribution to B3 still does come from electron loops and not from like uh, W bosons, or anything else. Um, and in this treatment, we'll not even need like this uh, improved positivity bounds that we had before. It's, it's quite clean. Uh, so just the statement is that the lowest energy process, the, like the leading process contributions to the graviton photon scattering in the standard model is completely dominated by electron loops. And this effect, uh, so we, what we did, we, we looked at those scatterings and like you have, you can just compute what the definite helicity scattering amplitudes are. And there, as before, they, they have the channel pole uh, in, in, in this particular channel of the scattering. And for these helicities, there, there are other contributions. And when applying positivity bounds on those, we didn't really learn um, anything new here because there were, um, yeah, we, we, we didn't learn much new in from, from these definite helicity scattering amplitudes. However, uh, we then said, let's look at indefinite helicity scattering. Um, so basically taking the initial and final states of uh, both photon and graviton in, in some indef indefinite polarizations and taking the, the state itself as a tensor product of the two. Uh, so we have like uh, new parameters, which is like A plus, A minus, H plus, H minus, which are just complex numbers normalized to one, um, uh, giving the probabilities of the state in being either one or the other helicity. And then we find that the positivity bounds after the regex procedure that I described earlier, that they just give uh, that the second order of the amplitude in the forward, second order derivative of the amplitude in the forward limit is just given by this one expression. And moreover, it is sine indefinite 
meaning that um, uh, these these numbers a plus and a minus they, they they can take more or less any values you like so you can flip the sign uh, in either direction and so for this particular choice uh, one can write it in a uh, in a very convenient form where you just have this four uh, times absolute value of b3 and this is like a complicated positivity bound where I have written out all those contributions you saw earlier that come from what remains from the regit behavior after you cancel out the t-channel pole. So this is like a really like a positivity bound, uh, a fair positivity bound, taking into account all the standard model contributions up, up to leading order. And you see they have this one positive quantity, which is the absolute value of B3. And we actually know what the B3 is. As I said before, it's dominated by the uh, contributions from the electron loops and it's given by electron charge over electron mass uh, to the second power. And uh, whereas the other quantities are UV quantities uh, that tell you what the behavior of the amplitude in the UV is. So basically this is what we call uh, IR bounds on UV physics because we will be now uh, drawing conclusions on what happens or what could be possible um, issues with the UV physics, given that this positivity bound has to be satisfied. Um, this will also be my conclusion slide, but I will talk about it. Um, it will still take me some time to go through this because that's like the, the conclusions that we draw. Um, and so I will just discuss in length this amplitude, sorry, this, this positivity bound and what we learn from it. Um, so you see that, uh, yeah, basically given uh, that this can be, uh, sorry, uh, no, sorry, sorry let, let, let me just um, go on. So what we see that the positivity bound uh, are violated by this uh, quantity that is B3 uh, because uh, this is a positive quantity of order E squared divided by electron mass squared. And what could be the possible resolution of this? Like the other question, like how this inequality can be satisfied? And one way how to satisfy this would be to say that this is a positive quantity that can be larger than 4b3. But since this number in front, uh, remember we said that this is, uh, this is the factor that needs to cancel out the graviton pole and this is actually of order one. And so is this. So the only way how to make this to compensate, like to give some uh, positive contribution would be that the residue of the, saying that the residue of this regipole varies at the scale that is of the order of this B3, which is E squared over um, electron mass squared. And this would, like plugging in the numbers, this would mean that it, the scale at which uh, Regipol varies is 10 to the minus three GeV, which is much less than the string scale. And uh, this would just be a very powerful implication um so it just so much less than what the string scale like string scale you would say something like that scale to the 16 gv like m plank to the 19. um so that would be quite a big statement uh if true uh, but it's definitely one of the possibilities so the other possibility how to satisfy this inequality it would be to compensate uh this quantity to balance this B3 com contribution with the scale uh, of the register slope, uh, which is the uh, register slope is like this uh, scale, scale at which uh, alpha prime varies, uh, then like setting this of the order of, uh, of, of B3. And in the same time, keeping alpha prime itself uh, of order inverse uh string scale to the power uh, inverse square of the string scale um 
this would then imply, if we would make this assumption of the variation of the registope, uh, if you remember how we uh, how we expanded the regit trajectory alpha t as a function of t started with two plus alpha prime t plus, and then they were the t squared uh, contributions. I'm sorry, there should be a square here. Um, so plugging in this assumption of, of the scale at which the alpha prime varies uh, would mean that, that alpha would be larger than three uh, at a very low scale, uh, at energy scale 10 to the four TeV. And what it means that alpha becomes, uh, it gets, hits the next integer it means that we start to hit higher, new higher spin states in our theory. Uh, that's what the rigid trajectory tells us. So you see, assuming that the B3, uh, the, the, posit the positivity of this quantity is maintained, is, is, is balanced with the, with, with the variation of the rigid slope, would mean that we have higher spin states at a very low scale. Um, so these two uh, are quite dramatic scenarios, which would basically, we, which come when we try to satisfy this uh, positivity bound by the quantities that are inside. So I, either, I, either this um, scale of the uh, variation of the residue of the regipole or the scale of the variation of the regis slope alpha prime. Um, so if we don't want to do that, we have to go back to the fundamental assumptions that we have as, that we took uh, to derive this. So that there was this causality, look, there were these causality locality assumptions, namely that there is a frasa type um, behavior of the amplitude at high energies that it, it doesn't grow uh, more than S squared. Um, and this formally, it has been proven only from string theory, only for dimensions that are larger than five. We have just like assumed that it would still work for D equals four, but we don't know for sure. Um, so, sorry. So this could be one possible, uh, place where we would have to abandon this assumption and rethink, rethink this in fa at fundamental level. And then again, of course, the thing about the light loops. Um, in this case, we also have uh, photons. You see, we are looking at graviton photon scattering. I discussed what we, what, how we treated the graviton loops, um, meaning the branch cut that would come from graviton loops by the scaling of the amplitude by M Planck square. Uh, there are still light loops that might, might, spoil, um, might spoil our arguments, say the photon loops themselves. Um, yeah, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to see how, how exactly this would, change now how to implement this in an in in an honest way but that would certainly be something one can think about um, but either way uh, what we wanted to show with this is that even when you even when you do assume even if you treat the t, t channel pole in some way there's always something that the positivity bounds tell us about the uv behavior of gravity in most of the time, like especially in this case, those are very severe implications and one should really understand um, what we learn from it and how to make use of it. And that was what we did. And thank you for your attention. Okay, Lasma.